Hello and good afternoon. My name is Kit of Hard Lens Media, and today we are joined here with one of the uh, Democratic gubernatorial candidates who's in the primary race right now, Bob Daver. Uh, thank you so much for joining Hard Lens Media. Thanks for having me this afternoon. All right, so you are in a race to get the Democratic nomination for governor of Illinois. Now, this race is becoming more intensified due to the current state of Illinois, as well as the aftermath of the 2016 uh, presidential election cycle. And candidates like Senator Daniel Bitts, Alderman Pawar, and T.U. Hardman are working to build coalitions with progressive grassroots organizations. And Kennedy and Pritzker have name recognition and connections to PACs, to donors, and media coverage. So what's going to separate your campaign in regards to outreach, and why should the people of Illinois choose you over the other candidates in the Democratic race? Well, first and foremost, all those individuals that you just named are all from Cook County. Okay, so they're from a finite geographical area of the state. I'm the only candidate from Southern Illinois that has a coalition that's statewide. Okay? Uh, I uh, served as uh, statewide president of the regional superintendents in Illinois, have professional colleagues throughout the state, uh, which are all part of my coalition as well. Um, I think what separates me from these other candidates in, in this race is the perception of Bob Diver is the downstate candidate. Uh, he's not perceived as being a Cook County politician. He's not perceived as being a party insider. Uh, this is a guy for the first time in 20 years that has uh, stepped up with the courage to run for real change in Springfield. And uh, I believe that in identity uh, with voters, that's how I'm being perceived and that's why I probably will be successful. Now, on your campaign uh, website, you state you have 20 years of uh, you know, public uh, service and experience in education and regional planning. So how does that past work af affect you in regards to policy decisions, and how will it help you possibly becoming governor of Illinois? Well, first and foremost, 38 years of my life have, has been being a, uh, involved in public education. Uh, 28 years as a public school teacher. 10 years uh, in school administration, and I've worked with uh, students of, of all capacities in school, not just the brightest, but some of the most at risk. In fact, right now, I manage an alternative school that I deal with some of the highest risk students in the state of Illinois, which gives me working knowledge of, of how you finance school operations, the significance of federal money, state money, and local monies in, in financing education uh, in the state, and how we can change and make that better for all schools, all school districts, and all students. There's not another candidate in this race that has 38 years of public education knowledge. I'm a past president of, of an IEA local. I've bargained contracts, uh, I've paid union dues. There's not another candidate in the race that has that knowledge. Uh, I also am an invested member of the retirement system. Okay? So I understand the importance, I understand the investment and the obligations that I've been asked to make for that public sector pension system. So the 22 years of local government experience, uh, I've served on a city council, I have been a township supervisor, I served two terms on a county board before being a countywide elected official. Local government is closest to their people. And let me explain this. Every piece of legislation that is passed in Springfield eventually works its way to be implemented by someone that's an elected official in local government. And, and the regulations that the state imposes up, upon our communities, upon our counties, and our regions, all filters through local government. So I, I understand firsthand the workings of that. And that's what I take to Springfield that's far different uh, you know, than someone who's uh, just decided they want to become governor uh, for whatever reason. Maybe they're inspired to be it. Maybe they're inspired for social reasons. Maybe they're inspired for their own, um, let's say, motivation to lead. Okay? But what I bring to, to Springfield is a true understanding of how to govern. And I want to explain this. Governing is an art. Okay? Knowing how to govern is an art. It is something that you acquire through having done it and through experience. And you wouldn't hire uh, someone to run a major business that had no business experience. 
So why would you elect someone in the state that's never governed? Now, let's talk about something that's, uh, that you're really close to, and that's being associated with unions. And on your campaign, you're very critical, uh, especially on your website, you're very critical about right to work. And you stand firm as a supporter of unions. Now, for a long time, there has been political action taken against uh, unions by both Democrats and Republicans. So what are your policies towards getting unions at the table again, and also at the same time getting businesses to reinvest into our state? Right. Well, let, let's look at this. Um, you know, many people, you know, uh, let's say, uh, do not respect unions. I want to say that. I'm going to use that, word, that I think the, the term respect because they see unions driving business out of the state at all. Now, I look at it completely different. Okay? I look at unions as the basis in which you provide a highly skilled workforce. And where you have a highly skilled workforce, that's where you draw business. Okay? Our, our unions throughout the state have training programs, second to none, on training skilled craftspeople, skilled operators, whether they're electricians, carpenters, plumbers, pipe fitters, iron workers. They, they have training facilities that are in place. If we, as, as a state, begin to diminish workers paying union dues that, that support these facilities, our level of skilled workforce will decrease. I know you could say, well, that could be provided at a community college. Well, maybe the skills can, but not the safety and the competence that is given through a unionized program. And so I, I believe that unions should be at the table with business. And, and that's where you develop good labor management relations. And that's something as governor that I will do, is that I will bring together a labor management council that we resolve issues in the state like workers' comp, unfair labor practice, and that we advance the skill level of Illinois' workforce to be competitive worldwide. Now, there's going to be a couple bits of pushback, especially in regards from businesses. Uh, for example, uh, minimum wage. Uh, there are a lot of critics of uh, a wage increase say that it would affect businesses and you know, costs will go up. Now, essentially, a lot of people, a lot of protests, especially stuff that Harlan's media has covered, um, in regards to the minimum wage, especially Friday the 15, people are coming more uh, supportive of this issue. So where do you stand on where the minimum wage should be at? And also, at the same time, what is a real livable wage for people living in the state? First and foremost, let's, let's look at this. Um, let's say in, in a most reasonable way that does not immediately impact with a shock and awe of a small business. Because I think that's maybe where the real pushback comes from the fight for 15. Okay? Um, and right now our minimum wage is 875. Uh, that is a difficult wage for someone working 40 hours a week to make a living and pay expenses on. So I, I believe the minimum wage in Illinois today ought to be $10. Uh, it was $10 in Missouri. I mean, uh, you can make a profit uh, at $10 an hour minimum wage if you're a business. Uh, to move the minimum wage immediately from $8.75 to $15, that's almost like doubling it. And that's where I think you get the shock and all. You know what I mean? From small business. I think we need to look at a progressive wage scale with a cost of living increase in it that moves us to uh, then what we call a living wage. The living wage I look at for 40 hour a week jobs. That, that are held by individuals 18 years of age and old that are truly in the workforce full time. Okay? They're, they're not high school kids that are working uh, maybe 20 hours a week to get work experience, part time job, extra money, spending money, helping out with some of the expenses maybe at home. But, but I'm talking about, when you talk about a living wage today, if you do the math, you're going to need to make $18.50 an hour. Okay? So that's what I see as a living wage. And, and there's a big difference between a living wage and what I say is minimum wage. Minimum wage is an entry level wage, it always was. So now let's look at another issue, especially something that's still affecting Illinois. And the scar of it, uh, I think, is not going to heal anytime soon. And that is the budgetary crisis that was between uh, Speaker of the House Michael Madigan and our current governor, Governor Bruce Rahner. So, uh, you know, we're still in recovery. So what will be your policy to rebuild, and what is, what is really necessary to effectively get Illinois' budget back on track? 
Well, first and foremost, you have to understand that we are, we as a state have $14.5 billion of unpaid bills as we talk today. You and I and every resident in the state of Illinois as a taxpayer pay $10 million of interest today. That's a fact, released by our state comptroller. So I have said, if I become governor, within 60 days, I will present legislation to bond all those bills and pay them all. Imagine what that would do for everybody that's owed money in the state. And first and foremost, it's the right thing to do to pay your bills. So we need to pay our bills. And then we put that debt interest into that budget, which won't be balanced, but it'll be a manageable budget. And we will know where we need to be then to pay that off in the term of office that I serve. So I will stabilize. And each year, within the time frame that the governor submits their, their budget to the legislature, I will submit a manageable budget with the debt interest, with improvements in paying down the bonds, and when I leave office, I will be debt free. Now, in an interview that you did with the Chicago Reader, you have stated that I would support a progressive income tax. There's only one solution. The debt has to be bonded out, and we have to pay down that debt with the principle of new tax revenue. How will you implement the progressive income tax, and how will that re revenue collected by a progressive income tax be passed to the people of Illinois? Because there's been a lot of criticism towards progressive income tax. I don't think a lot of people are familiar with that concept. Well, most people don't really understand progressive income tax. It's, it's a buzzword I think a lot of political candidates are using. It's a quick answer to the solutions of the uh, you know, revenue problem we have. Now, yeah, and, and you're, very, you're very correct. The progressive income tax doesn't necessarily mean it's going to solve your problem. But here, here's what I look at. The middle class uh, of, of Illinois continues to pay more taxes. They pay, they pay more income tax, they pay more property tax, they pay more sales tax. In Cook County, they're paying a beverage tax. I mean, these, these are all tax issues that keep eating up revenue from the middle class. When I say we're the tax means, okay, we're carrying the load for those who can't pay, we're carrying the load for those who don't want to pay. Okay? So what, what a progressive income tax does is it sets a scale from from one to whatever percent you want to put it at as a ceiling. And, and I've said I, I would begin on a scale from one to six percent, in which my basement is based upon $25,000 a year, and everybody pays some income tax in Illinois. And, and one percent of that would be $250. And, and I will generate about two and a half to three billion dollars a year new revenue on the scale that I will establish. And for those in the middle, they won't pay more, they may pay less, but those that enter a higher threshold of income will be asked to pay more. And there will not be tax loopholes in which we're letting those on the upper scale not pay, corporations not paying, everybody needs to pay, and we will solve our revenue problem. But we cannot continue to tax the middle class as our solution to our revenue. And when we increase the income tax to 4.95%, uh, it probably uh, directly affected middle class more than it did anybody else because they have less revenue, as we know now, to spend on, on goods and services. Now, this is going to be an issue that's going to probably be debated in the Illinois State House and Senate. So, during Rauner's time as governor, uh, he constantly clashed with Speaker House Michael Madigan, which I mentioned before led to the budgetary crisis that Illinois is still recovering from. If you are governor, what will be your administration's actions in regards to getting issues besides revenue and other policies uh, passed in the Illinois State Senate and House? And uh, how, how will you uh, basically deal with uh, the, the Illinois State Senate and House in, in the short term? Well, let's just begin with good relations at the start. Let, let's not go into office with, uh, let's say, having created bad relations before we get there. And, you know, human relations are about, you know, not being overly critical of someone, not, uh, let's say, throwing vendettas at people. Uh, let's just not say bad things about one another, and then maybe we can sit down and work together. Maybe we can shake hands and agree that, uh, you know, hey, we, we have to come together to make the state a better place. So, uh, speaking of uh, another issue in regards to revenue collection, um, in an interview you did with Politico, you said in regards to cannabis legalization that it's got to be a referendum by the people. Currently, there are two bills in the Illinois State Senate and House, uh, Senate Bill 316 and House Bill 2353, which are calling for cannabis to be legal 
in the state of Illinois for recreational use as well. Uh, if both bills are passed and you are governor, will you support these bills? And what is your campaign's official stance on cannabis legalization and decriminalization? Well, I said this. Um, I would sign a bill into law to legalize cannabis in the state of Illinois uh, by the will of the people. Now, I, I want a non-binding referendum by the people. I want them to pass it. Uh, I pass, they, they show me that they want this, I'll sign it, okay? Uh, until there's a referendum that shows me that the people of Illinois want this passed when I sign it, and I'll tell you why. Uh, jokingly, I've said, I'm not gonna let a bunch of lobbyists go into Springfield and uh, push a, uh, a bill through to uh, legalize marijuana. I, wa I want the people, I want it to be done right. I want it to be done just like it was done in Colorado. And I know that was done by uh, what would take a constitutional amendment in Illinois to do. But uh, it, that's the way it was done in, uh, in Colorado and that's the way it ought to be done in Illinois. The people should have a voice in, uh, in whether or not this should be legal or not. Now, speaking and, of... and I want to talk about the decriminalization. Oh yeah, go ahead, okay. please, please. Well, let's talk about minor offenders. Um, and, and this is something that disturbs me uh, about how we are dealing with uh, our, our current uh, minor offenders of, and, and the criminalization of this. And I think this is something that we definitely need to review. Uh, we, and, and this has to be re reviewed in our criminal justice systems and, and in our reform measures. But if something is not legal, then it is illegal. And there has to be, uh, may, maybe we, we reduce uh, the incarceration and we look at monetary fines, okay? Uh, but, you know, we, we have definitely had a social revolution on this issue, okay? And it's something that definitely needs to be examined as to who we're incarcerating and to what degree users are punished. All right, I want to actually do a quick follow-up on, especially how you mentioned Colorado, as well as uh, war on drugs. Uh, the state of Colorado, as you mentioned, uh, is currently right now has a budgetary surplus, something that our state uh, really needs. So uh, if there is a chance that Illinois is able to have cannabis legalized here in our state, what will be your uh, administration's policy in regards to protecting cannabis entrepreneurs and buyers uh, who might be harassed by Jeff Sessions and the Trump administration because Jeff Sessions has basically said he wants to intensify uh, harsher regulations uh, against cannabis and cannabis-related products. Well, if you've, you've followed the Colorado uh, legalization of cannabis, for, first of all, they, they invested $6 million of their budget on, on regulations to make sure that growers uh, grow the, uh, the amount that they're allowed Okay, that individuals who uh, are allowed to grow so much home-growing cannabis uh, are not, you know, I mean, overgrowing. Uh, so, so there was an investment to uh, regulate, okay, which Illinois would have to do, okay. Um, but uh, you know, the Trump administration, uh, th this will be state policy. Uh, I would want the policy well crafted, uh, well put into place, and and be able to be properly managed and to make sure when we do this that uh, we have revenue growth from it and not revenue deficit. And in regards to possibly Jeff Sessions wanting to bring in FBI agents to harass uh, workers well, or entrepreneurs. Like well, well we uh, that, that's why I said that we would invest our, our regulations that, that would be able to deal with them. All right, and let's deal with another uh, question that's, you know, relates to you. Now, you uh, described yourself before as the only downstate candidate running for, as a Democrat for governor. And there is a, a, a serious issue in regards to the fact that the Democratic Party has abandoned a lot of the regions here within the state of Illinois. So what has been your outreach towards regions that you know the Democrats have no influence in or have abandoned? And what will be your administration's uh, policy to regain trust and support from potential voters? Well, uh, it's unique that you ask that question because I go to many of those regions where there's been a little Democratic interest. That's why I spoke last night in Clay County, which is in the southeastern part of the state of Illinois. It just isn't an area that maybe Democrats would have much interest in. Um, and to rebuild a Democratic base to the state of Illinois, you have to realize that every county in 2014 uh, voted for Bruce Rauner other than Cook County. Bruce Runner won every county 
other than Cook County in 2014. And, and Donald Trump's sweep in the southern part of the state in 16 was just so evident because voters in those, in those counties uh, outside of Cook uh, didn't see a relationship with the candidate. And uh, that, that's why I came out to run, is because there's a relationship that's built with my campaign and downstate. Now, Americans are losing trust in both parties, and 40% of Americans are identifying themselves as independents. When holding rallies or doing public speaking uh, for your campaign, uh, what have been your interactions with potential voters uh, from, from Democrats, Republicans, and independents? What have they said to you in regards to what they want done in Illinois? Well, I, I love independent voters because they, they identify with me strongly because I've been a local elected official. And many local elected officials are not identified with either party. Okay? So uh, what, what I have to say uh, to independents and Republicans is that we, is that they, and Democrats, is that we all need to join together for the good of the state. And there's only one way we're going to do this. There's only one way we're going to do this is if we decrease the polarization between these different camps. Okay? And we bring, we bring people together at the table, and we collectively sit down, and we do what's right. Okay, and uh, final question uh, for, uh, for this interview. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Where can our viewers, subscribers, and listeners uh, learn more about your campaign, find you on social media, uh, work with me, though? Well, uh, I encourage you first to go to our website at bob uh, and bobdiver.com, and you can click on there to uh, volunteer, or you also can scroll down. You can go to our Facebook page. You can follow our campaign daily there, or you can follow us on Twitter. All right, well, uh, thank you again so much for joining uh, Heartlands Media. Very appreciative to have you here. I appreciate the opportunity to share my uh, view with, your, uh, with all your listeners. Well, thank you so much. Peace, everyone. You're watching Heartlands Media.